Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying Sasquatch encounters. Now, before I start, I want to let you know that on this channel, I like to share encounters that are more of a slow boil, that tend to create an atmosphere and a mood. If you're a fan of encounters like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notifications. I post new videos every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and if you have your notifications on, you'll be the first to know when those videos go live. All right, let's get right into it. Last summer, my fiancé and I joined her brother and his wife for a camping trip on Lake Pend Orly in northern Idaho. They rented a cabin from some friends and invited us along. We all live in Boise, so it meant driving from the bottom almost clear to the top of the state, but we were looking forward to totally relaxing over a week and a half with nothing planned. When we arrived in the town of Sandpoint, we spent the night in a motel, and while eating dinner in a cafe that night, a local resident came in and seated himself at the corner for a cup of coffee. So typical of a friendly small town, a half dozen people greeted him, and the restaurant owner came out of the kitchen and casually, in his evidently normal loud voice, asked, Any more on the Sasquatch yet? The man responded with, No. Nothing much more, but the boy won't lose his arm. He went on to say the doctor had put two screws in it and it should be healed by the time school started in the fall. The four of us were really curious, as they were conversing on the opposite stools and now we could no longer hear. So finally, I couldn't stand it any longer. So I got up and wandered over to take a stool alongside the gentleman and introduce myself. I told them that our party was really interested in what happened, and I explained that we had just arrived in town on vacation and told them we were anxious to hear more. They both began telling our group, as the others had gathered around, that a cabin near a place called Thompson's Outpost had recently been the scene of an unusual happening. After asking if we were familiar with Bigfoot, we answered in the affirmative, explaining that Judy's, my fiancé's brother, Tim, had a friend who was an associate professor at Utah State, and he had just come up to Idaho for a seminar held by Dr. Jeff Meldrum, and those gentlemen immediately responded with enthusiasm. They both seemed very familiar with Dr. Meldrum, as he seemed to enjoy celebrity status in most of Idaho, as... They say he was the absolute expert on Sasquatch. They explained that a tourist's 11-year-old son had seen what he described as a big, hairy orangutan, and since it took off running, he gained the courage to chase after it. And when it suddenly stopped by a large grove of pines, the kid threw a rock at it, hitting it in the leg, and no sooner had it cried out in pain, a giant Sasquatch came from behind the tree, and with a loud roar, it came after the kid. He went running and screaming back to their cabin with the Sasquatch rapidly chasing him. The panicky brat was screaming at the top of his lungs, and just as it caught him by the arm and wretched him to a stop, the kid's parents came around the corner and started yelling, more like the dad hollering and the mom shrieking, according to the other cabin residents. So the big guy dropped the kid and vanished. That's all they knew, but the cafe owner agreed to tell us more the next evening. We figured that to mean, buy dinner and I'll tell you the rest of the story. The next morning, as we left Sandpoint to make it to our rental cabin, we were all excited by the thought that we might encounter a Bigfoot as our rental was close to the trading post. But in our entire time there, we never did see one. We did have more meals in that cafe, however, and I think we were in the 70% of visitors who do not see Sasquatch. On to the next story. It happened in the Newberry Cave System in Central Oregon where the government had suspended all caving and exploration for a period of time. There were two major reasons for their actions suspending much of the visitation of Oregon's many caves. One was the belief that all bats were carrying rabies, 
so they had to cordon off all caves until their inspections could be done. The rabies theory later turned out to be false. In addition, the government had found that there had been human usage of the caves dating back to the 1300s, so the Federal Antiquities Act of 1906 was another of the reasons to block visitors from certain caves, hoping to find historic events that they did not want to disturb, which is understandable. My particular adventure was with three friends, one of whom is my wife today. We had been anxious to explore some of the lava tubes in the system, as we had heard that many of them had networks over a mile long. So we stocked up on gear. When the day came, we arrived at our chosen cave. I don't recall for certain, but I believe it was named Wind Cave. We had our packs full of warm clothes in addition to the gear we were wearing as the caves normally run around 35 to 50 degrees. We also had a supply of solid fuel heaters, flashlights, candles, and carbide lights were prohibited, batteries, first aid kits, and we wore aluminum caving helmets, without which I would have no ears remaining. My wife remembers that I was continually banging my head as I walked too close to the sides because it was harder packed sand and easier going. This tunnel system was part of the Newberry Group, and I do remember vaguely that this particular volcano was connected to the Mount Mazama systems around 7,000 years old. We parked at the furthest end of the parking area, so anyone coming to this lot would maybe think we were day hiking through the trail system, just in case the Mounties came. The cold air rushed to meet us, and within a few minutes, after entering the cave, so did the darkness. We were now in another world. I had never before been in a cave except on a tour back in Dakota, but this cave was actually an empty lava tube. These tubes stretched out like rivers of molten lava, and as their surfaces cooled, they became like tunnels. And as long as the volcano was erupting and the upper surface was cooled by the air, it became a hollow passageway for the continual flow of lava that kept flowing and flowing. It's hard to tell from the surface that it's even under the rock, because the upper shell of lava spread out in all directions from above. It looks like solid rock, while underneath, the lava was still flowing inside this smooth walled cave. When eruption ceased, the remaining lava kept flowing out, and then it gradually cooled, leaving a tunnel. Over the centuries, sand from the surface cracks and minor earthquakes covered the entire floor, so it mirrored the rounded tunnels over some of the highways and railroads of today. Our party had plenty of batteries, and we each had small caver's lights attached to our helmets and flashlights in our hands. We weren't worried about bears being inside, as the entrance wouldn't allow anything that large past the gated opening, but we found small prints that may have been from fox and rodents. We did check for rattlesnakes, because we heard that rattlers would hang around the cave entrances to be able to move in and out depending on air temperatures as they lay waiting for prey. Oh, how carefully we checked. We kept traveling down this tube, and to all of us, it felt like we were on a gradual descent, which may have been caused by our imagination, or because the erupting lava had been flowing down a hill, which actually disappeared when the lava flowed over it. That would be the logical reason, or the lava could have kept going to empty the tube. We were confronted with our first decision when after around 400 feet, the tube split into two tunnels, both roughly the same size. It appeared that the two floors each had about the same amount of traffic, as there were only divots where people or animals had trod, as no footprints were made in the soft sand. We decided to stay to our right, on the way in, as it seemed slightly larger, and then left when we left to come out. We next came to a very large opening where the ceiling of the tunnel had collapsed, leaving a huge pile of rock around 50 feet high. So, we followed the obvious route where others had gone, and after about an hour of climbing up and down some pretty large, automobile-sized rocks, 
we found ourselves back in our sand floored tunnel again. Here, while we had some rocks to use for tables and seats, we had lunch and took time to dump sand from our boots and relax a while. We were conserving our lights on their lowest setting to extend their battery life. Up ahead, we heard a thumping, and I pictured a child running impetuously in front of its parents, so we all were watching the opening, fully expecting a family to momentarily emerge when one of our party sneezed from the ever-present dust, and just at that moment, the footsteps stopped. We all thought it strange, but we reasoned that the child had heard the sneeze and retreated to the safety of its parents. Then the sound of footsteps started again, but faster and growing more distant. Dismissing it as maybe our overactive imaginations, we packed up and continued on our way again. But I think we all caught ourselves casting our light beams further ahead and also on the cave floor. We thought it was quite strange that other cavers would not, out of common courtesy, among explorers have come to meet us. As it was obvious, they knew we were there. We walked steadily for another hour without hearing anything other than our own footfalls, just treading in the same boring manner until suddenly, without warning, we emerged into a massive cavern. This we had not expected, and due to the time of year and the vague prohibition by the government on caving, we were without the customary brochures and printed guides they normally handed out. This cavern could easily have held a football stadium. Casting our light beams in all directions, we were doing our individual exploring when Trudy said, look up there, and she pointed to a portion of the ceiling on the far side of the stone. And then Tom said, lights off. His words needed no explanation as we went black. The blue sky was lighting up the far end of the cave. A huge section of this cavern had fallen in, and the gigantic rock mountain of rubble confronting us was made up of half the ceiling. As we sat silently on an immense flat section of rock and gathered our thoughts, something was making its way along the far wall, and it was not a person, although it appeared to be walking on two legs. We had all seen it at the same time, and we all began whispering at that same moment. The being seemed to walk almost like an orangutan, as it would dip its opposite shoulder and leg as they seemed to do when I'd seen them in zoos. The animal was carefully and soundlessly moving down the rubble pile until it was about on the cave floor and level to us. We momentarily lost sight of it, and no one even dared speak not out of any fear, because it appeared much smaller than us, although we had no references to use for comparison at that distance. I was glad that we had quietly entered this cavern, because the animal didn't appear to be moving in fear, but seemed perfectly at home. Finally, after breathlessly standing there, the monkey guy reappeared at the far end of the opening where the lava tube was again in evidence and disappeared into the opening. It seemed as if none of us had dared breathe as we were all acting like we were out of breath as we began talking about what we had just seen. Hearts pounding with excitement, we determined this too have been a Sasquatch. We had all heard about the stories of ape caves across the Columbia River in Washington State, and that was not far from here, so we thought that may have been how those caves were named. We had been hearing about them being present throughout Oregon and the entire Northwest, but not being an outdoor-type people, we had never paid much attention. From what we had heard from friends who had actually encountered these Sasquatch, the Forestry Department, and all other government entities were in a total state of denial. They refused to do more than accept a report, which it was said that the reports went directly into the trash, according to confidential sources, and they had orders to keep all incidents under a cover of disclaimer. I was told by one of our friends that the government didn't want hundreds of Sasquatch hunters running around our huge forests, shooting at everything that moves. They had done a confidential survey, and the determination came back that they would need to double their budget if they admitted that Sasquatch was alive and well. 
We were concerned, but this animal was obviously more afraid than we were, and since Jimmy and I were both carrying 38 revolvers, we felt safe enough to convince our friends to continue down the lava tube. Lights back on again, we entered the continuance of the tube, and we could plainly see the divots from the animal spaced as though it was running. So we put fears aside, and about an hour later, we came to another open area. But this was different. It seemed like a giant dry pool of sand that opened up in the center, and there were two tunnels leading out from this point. Something may have caused the blockage and diverted the lava, but by this time, we had come to a mutual decision that we would spend the night at this comfortable spot and continue deeper into the cave in the morning. We had all but forgotten that the Sasquatch was somewhere in one of these tunnels, and we couldn't tell which of these passages it had gone into. The height of each tunnel was about seven or so feet, and they were both wide enough for two people to walk side by side. So we had chosen the right path one in case there were more options up ahead. Finally, we could relax completely and we opted to use the left tunnel as our camp latrine. Then we prepared the area we were now in for cooking and sleeping. This was quite an experience as we had been in darkness all day, and even though it was early in the evening, after we ate, we were fairly well exhausted, so we climbed into our space blankets with flashlights stuffed into our hiking shoes and guns in jacket pockets right by our heads. We slept soundly. Soundly, that is, until we were suddenly sitting up, scrambling for our lights and guns, because something else was in the cavern with us. As my light clicked on, I was confronted with a huge animal leaning over me, and I had smacked into its leg when I reached for my flashlight. The animal was as shocked as I was, and it let out a sort of screech. That, in retrospect, reminded me of an alley cat scream. Then, two more of the animals joined in the screaming as they ran by us and plunged into the blackness of the tunnel. There we parted ways as they raced down the tunnel back towards the way we had come in. We all began scrambling to turn on more lights until we had the place looking like a newsroom. We had seen enough to know it was a Bigfoot family. A noise suddenly emerged from where our guests had departed and it sounded like one of them had fallen down and then it occurred to us that they would have had no light at all. It became obvious that we must have driven them out of the large cavern where we first saw the smaller one, and they must have run before us up the last distance to where we ate. We surmised that they had used the light from our own lights to stay ahead of us, but when we camped, they must have been hiding in one of the other tubes in darkness except for the reflection of our beams. Only after we had turned out our lights and fallen asleep did they dare to venture out. But being as there was no light to go by, one of them had stepped on my hand and all hell broke loose, as they say. We were quickly packed up, and with extra lights on, we headed back up the cave towards the entrance, not knowing if they could block us in by dislodging rocks. We were not anxious to find out. They hadn't seemed hostile, but fear is what makes most animals dangerous to humans, so we quickened our pace. Periodically, we turned off our flashlights for a few moments to try to figure out how these Sasquatch could navigate any of these tunnels. We soon had our answer. As the sunlight had begun to show signs of life, and even without our lights, we could easily navigate for a long ways down the tube. The sun coming through the huge hole in the cave's roof reflected through the tubes, likely due to what seemed like a sprinkling of gypsum or something sparkling in the walls of the tunnel. We stopped for another rest at the monstrous cavern, and we carefully approached with lights out and slowly peered around the corner before entering. And way up, just below the hole in the ceiling, we caught a glimpse of a brown shape exiting over the edge to the outside. We finally reached the entrance, and we were met with a SWAT team. Not actually, but there were two sheriff's vehicles with lights flashing and four officers about to enter the cave with hands on their guns. They seemed as surprised to see us as we were to run into them. Even though it was early in the morning, a local resident had been walking his dog up toward the top of the flat-topped hill above us and he had reported what he said were several human screams that sounded like someone was being murdered. We all looked at each other, and then, as if rehearsed ahead of time, we all laughed and responded with the story that we were taking turns scaring each other in the dark. 
Good thing we thought fast. As if we had told about the Sasquatch, we may have been in trouble for sneaking in the caves in the first place, although we may have become famous. Apologizing for not realizing anywhere near the place, we packed up and got out of there with our best kept secret. What we will always have is the fact that Sasquatch is real. On to the next story. Two years prior to the day of this sighting, I had met my wife-to-be at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. Mary Beth and I had both signed up for the Air National Guard from two different points on the compass and had first met in Sunday's church service on the base. It was love at first sight for both of us. We actually only saw each other a handful of times while on the base and then I headed back north and she headed back east to Louisiana, her home state. We stayed in touch, and I had made several trips down to her home, where, on the last trip, I had proposed to her, and she said yes. Speaking for myself, I had no real anchor around my leg keeping me in Pennsylvania. She, on the other hand, had an extensive family and a little girl she had out of wedlock when she was 15. The family was really tight-knit, and the mother and grandmother looked after little Julia while Mary Beth was doing the guard thing. I decided to move down south with them and make a go of it locally. Anywhere that Mary Beth was, I was happy to be. Things were working out really well. I had scored a job with a local utility company that actually paid real decent compared to the going wages in the area. According to what I was used to, this was a depressed area, but the people didn't even know it, and they were happy. I'm sure that there is more than one life lesson wrapped up in that statement somewhere. At any rate, their family had several homes scattered in a small area, and all of them were built on stilts in case of flooding. The reason why I mention this will come into play later on. Mary Beth, Julia, and I had taken over one of the homes as our own, which was really gracious of the family. There was zero mortgage and zero rent, which was quite a way to start off a marriage. Now, the stilts on this house were about six feet tall. There was a well-built staircase that came up alongside the house, which brought you right into the kitchen. Facing the front of the house were two rooms, side by side, with a half wall dividing them. The room to the left was the dining room, which was connected to the kitchen by a pass-through window for serving food, and the room on the right was the den. Both the dining room and the den had large picture windows on the front wall of the house that actually faced the road. There were houses across the street from us as well as on both sides and to the rear of the house was a dense forest that became really boggy as you walked into it. I was told by some of the family and the locals that there was shit in those woods you don't want to meet up with, even when the sun was shining. I had taken the message at the time with a grain of salt, knowing that these folk were a little bit different than what I was accustomed to in the way that they lived and the things that they said. The three of us were in the house for several months, and on more than one occasion, Julia had called for Mary Beth during the night. On several of these nights, Julia had come to sleep with us, and when I asked her what she saw, she said a big dog. When I asked her what she meant, she said a big dog was smiling at her through the window, and she didn't like him. As I said, this same thing had occurred on a number of nights, spaced out over several months, so it wasn't like every night she just wanted to sleep with us. Now, this house was built on a lot that had an angled grade to it. The side of the house that Julia's bedroom was on had about four feet of stilts exposed, whereas on the opposite side of the house, there was a full six feet of exposed timber. I don't know why, but one day I was out next to the house. I grabbed a five foot long rake. I held up the rake up to the house under Julia's bedroom window. As a rough estimate, it was about seven feet or so to the bottom of her window and about 10 to the top. I remember chuckling to myself and saying, now that's a serious dog. And I blew it off. I remember the day as if it were yesterday, being the 9th of October. Mary Beth was in the kitchen 
baking some corn muffins while Julia and I were in the den. I was sitting in an easy chair watching the tube and Julia was playing with some toys on the floor in front of me. I must remind you that this side of the house was facing the street and not the woods. There was a fierce rainstorm raging outside and the power had flickered on and off several times and then it went off for good. We lit some candles and thankfully Mary Beth didn't lose the muffins because we had gas. It was 7.30 p.m. and the lightning and thunder started to come rolling in. It was so loud and frequent that Julia had jumped onto my lap. I couldn't blame her because it was even freaking me out, so much so that I was wishing that I could jump into someone else's lap myself. I was looking down at a book with this nice pedestal candle burning next to me, and every time the lightning flashed, the entire picture window in front of me lit up. On one of the flashes, I swore I saw the silhouette of something large in the window, and then it went dark. I was now looking straight at the glass, but it was black. No sooner had my eyes got accustomed to the dark than another lightning flash lit up the window, and there it was. The upper body of a large, hairy creature with pointy ears sticking up like a wolf's. I didn't want to scare anybody, but suddenly I was a believer in Julia's story. I told Julia to go in by mommy because I had to see something, and so so she did. I put my face right up against the glass. As I did, I distinctly saw something dart off to the side of the house. I walked down the hall to Julia's window and looked out, but I saw nothing. Mind you, it was very dark and the power was out. I then went to the rear of the house, looking out towards the woods and saw nothing out there as well. At about 10 o'clock, the power came back on and the storm was gone. I told Mary Beth I was going out to the car for my smokes and I grabbed a flashlight. I went down the stairs and headed straight for the front of the house to where the window was that I had seen this creature. I needed affirmation that I wasn't hallucinating or something, but I knew what I had seen and it wasn't a reflection. As I shone the light on the ground, there were a number of very large and very long, oddly shaped footprints in the soggy soil. They were very narrow at the heel and very broad at the toes, of which there were four. That's right, there were four toes on each print. And the feet were almost 20 inches long, respectively being sunk into the ground a good two inches. I looked around with the light and saw nothing. It was at that very moment my neighbor Clyde pulled in with his truck, his house being less than 30 feet away from mine. When he jumped out, he said, Is everything all right? I said to him, You ought to come over here and have a look at this. I told him what had happened as we both stood there looking at the prince. He said to me, Sweet Lord Jesus, what you got there, boy, are the footprints of a Rougarou. He said, I never thought in all my days I would ever set eyes on them, and here they are. I said to him, what the hell is a Rougarou? He told me, in these parts, it's known as a wolfman from hell, and you sure don't want to mess with them. No way, no how. From what I saw in the lightning flashes, this thing was halfway up the picture window. Its shoulders looked to be four feet across. I could definitely see tall, pointy ears that stuck straight up like they were pinned. The weirdest thing were these four-toed hoof prints that it had left being under the window. To this day, I never go in the woods behind our home unless I am armed for bear or in this case, armed for Rougarou, whichever comes along first. On to the next story. In 2005, I had already been living in Texas for nine years. I was employed by a large ranching firm and my job consisted of doing just about anything and everything you could imagine. Over the course of my tenure with the firm, the boys and I had been on many a hunt in our leisure time. We had also spent a good deal of time hunting varmint and other critters that attacked livestock and the like. Without telling you where I was at the time, simply because I haven't asked permission to do so, there was a group of men who were making a side living hunting wild hogs for landowners all over the area. In case you are unaware, wild hogs are infesting the entire southern United States, and they are spreading like the plague. Not only are they doing a tremendous amount of property damage, 
but in some cases, they are beginning to attack humans. Some of these hogs can weigh in at over a thousand pounds and are capable of killing someone. Now, there was one group of fellas that had asked me during the course of my employment if I was interested in making some good side money, to which I said, absolutely. The side business of which they were speaking was that of hunting wild hogs at night. These guys were so skilled and so well prepared for what they did that they actually were using military grade night optic helmets and infrared scoped and silenced rifles. I had been out on well over 50 hunts with these boys. Although many of their clients were repeat business, we never really knew where we may end up on the next call. The people who called in for help were mostly concerned about the hogs coming too close to where they lived and their children played. This was a really big concern, as you could imagine. A hog could charge a child and gash them open with their tusks, and they would eat the flesh and blood if they felt like it. The men trailered in what were basically heavy-duty, modified electric golf carts that could run around without any noise at night. Maybe golf cart is a bad term because these were more like stomping 4x4s than golf carts. At any rate, we were well into a large tract of land that had been called into for the fifth time by the landowner. I learned while I was doing this work that hogs multiply at a rate of 20% a year, so if you don't do anything about them, you can quickly have a problem on your hands. There are millions of them in the United States as we speak, and they are growing in numbers at a ridiculous rate annually. Pigs are also known to be one of the smartest animals on the planet, and these hogs are part of that family. While working on many of these properties, we had noticed that the hogs take advantage of mingling in the area of cows and steer. They seem to use them as an early warning system for potential incoming predators such as us. Many times, we are, as we are scoping out some of the larger hogs we wanted to cull, the cows would start mooing well before we could get into range, and the hogs, sensing danger, would quickly scamper off into the woods. We had to exercise great caution that we didn't want to arbitrarily shoot a cow passing in front or behind a hog as we took the shot. It was late Saturday night when we had made our way deep into this 2,000 plus acre piece of land when we saw a large herd of these hogs running around and we stopped. It's not uncommon for a pack of coyotes to try to take down the young or the lame and we were thinking that this was exactly what was happening, hence the herd running. As we were focusing on what the herd had been running from, one of the guys in the group said, if I didn't know any better, it looks to me there's a large bear tearing into a hog on the ground over there. We all knew there were no bears and so did he, but he couldn't make any sense out of what exactly was huddled over this apparent boar on the ground. I was looking intently and saw what I believed was a long arm working on a fallen hog. It was only moments later when what had been crouched over the hog stood to its feet, picked up the mammoth hog, slinging it over its shoulder. The hog had to weigh 300 pounds, and it looked like a small dog when this creature picked it up. Compared to the size of the beast we were seeing, as soon as it stood up, two of the boys said, That's a damn Bigfoot. It's incredible, Bobby said. That's why the herd was running so fast. That big bastard just took one of them out for dinner. We were watching the scenario go down at about 200 yards, so it was difficult to judge the size of the Bigfoot. But we were well schooled at judging the size of hogs. Based on prior experience, this Bigfoot seemed to be in mass at least five times as big as the hog. And the way in which it flipped this 300-pound pig on its shoulder was like you or I grabbing a 10-pound sack of spuds. I mean, I mean, it just flipped it onto its back and started walking away. We watched it walking for about a hundred yards when Davy said, let's try and follow it. Of course, we didn't know if this Bigfoot knew we were even there, but we knew he was there because we were using night vision and infrared. We kept our distance, but this thing was walking really fast. A couple of times, we had temporarily lost sight of him as he passed through some heavy brush and thicket. About 20 minutes later, we could see that he was approaching a thicket where there were two others awaiting his return, one being shorter than him and the other being quite small, maybe four or so feet in height. 
we now knew that this must have been a father out on the hunt and returning with a kill. The little one started to jump around like a child having received a present. After a few moments, they all seemed to squat down around the hog, apparently feasting on it. We eased on out of there and at sunup had told the landowner what we had seen. He was real interested, as you could well imagine, and later that afternoon we had agreed to meet up and head back to where we had seen them. At about 5 p.m., we made our way into the spot where we had seen the meeting. There was a small pack of coyotes gathered around the spot. We drove in and spooked them off to expose what was the remains of a hog. As it turns out, what was left, which wasn't much, was the carcass of a much bigger hog than we anticipated. This hog, before it was eaten, had to have been 700 pounds which is nearing monster size for these critters. This also meant that the Bigfoot was even stronger and larger than we had thought, judging the size of the hog against what we thought the Bigfoot size was. Looking now at this hog, I would have to say that the Bigfoot was well over 2,000 pounds and more than likely well over 10 feet tall based on what we had seen the night before. The landowner asked us why we didn't bag it, and to a man, we had no answer. To us, I guess, it didn't seem like the right thing to do at the time. We were all just fascinated by the sheer spectacle of seeing this thing. Nobody had even mentioned pulling the trigger or dispatching it when we had the chance. Think about picking up 700 pounds and throwing it over your shoulders. If by some chance you can make sense out of that, now think about walking a mile in the brush with a hog on your back. The sheer strength and endurance of these monsters is incredible. If this sized hog would have attacked you or me, it could have easily killed us, and yet somehow this Bigfoot was able to take it down in the open field and kill it. I only wish I had been looking in the direction when the takedown had occurred. That would have been truly amazing to watch. On to the next story. This is an encounter I had with a creature commonly known as Bigfoot in a remote northern part of California state in 2003. Who am I? I prefer to remain anonymous. Does that lessen the credibility of my story? I'm sure it does, but I don't care. I don't want credit or recognition and all that comes with it, especially in the case of a Bigfoot sighting. I'm telling my story for two reasons. First, it is for my own mental and emotional health. Second, it's for those of you who may be in similar situations. If you have actually seen something or even had an interaction with it, you are not alone. For those of you who think you would love to see a Bigfoot, think again and think hard. While I never dreamed of seeing the creature, I've thought on occasion that it would be neat to see one. Maybe had I seen one crossing the road or walking through a meadow from a reasonable distance, it would have been neat. What I experienced was anything but. I believe I saw a surviving yet undiscovered hominid. Before my encounter and the subsequent research I've done since, the existence of a Bigfoot was something I thought was highly unlikely. But I have since realized that what I saw is an actual scientific possibility, a probability even. Not only is there recent historical references to these creatures by white men in the early settlements of California, Indians told Spanish padres of the hairy giants who lived near them. Early hunters, lumberjacks, and explorers virtually all have stories of sightings, if not encounters, and interactions with these hairy men. In fact, indigenous peoples all over the world have tales and stories of wild men as part of their culture. Just a short time ago, gorillas were regarded with the same skepticism as Bigfoot is today. Most wrote off the stories of the ape men of Africa as fabrications or mistakes or even mental illness. Of course, gorillas were proven to exist. Of course, gorillas were proven to exist. The same holds true for many species. They are spotted. Most refuse to believe they exist. They are proven to exist. One big difference here is that Bigfoot is a bipedal creature with an intelligence that could possibly approach that of modern man. This may make people more uncomfortable. A higher intelligence may also explain how they are so successfully elusive of man. It occurred to me that there may well be interactions, communications between modern man and the Bigfoot. For all we know, elders of Indian tribes or park rangers or some small group of humans speak with these creatures and help them remain hidden. I have no reason to think this is true. It just popped into my head. 
Scientifically, we know of the existence of many species similar to man. While humans today are of several different races, we are all of the same species. There is plenty of fossil evidence that proves the existence of these other species of man and upright bipedal creatures. I don't include all that detail here because either you know this already or you need to go and read it yourself. I mention it here to illustrate how my attitude was able to transform from one of pretty skeptical a Bigfoot exists to it's possible, even probable, they exist. After having looked a little deeper into the matter, it doesn't seem all that far-fetched or ridiculous to me. I've kept this secret too long. It's been almost 10 years and it's been a constant burden. I don't like to edit myself. I speak my mind. I say what I mean and I mean what I say. But this... No way. I've kept this in because I knew a vast majority of people would think me a liar or crazy or both. I didn't tell my wife at first for the same reason, but she knew something was wrong. That I was keeping something from her. It chipped away at our marriage for a few months. Until things had gotten so bad, I finally decided I had to tell her. I could understand Jane's, not her real name, point of view now. I'm sure the last thing she thought I would tell her was that I saw a Bigfoot. She knew I was holding something back and assumed it was bad. All the time between me returning from Oregon and the day I told her, she assumed I was cheating on her. When I told her my story, she became enraged. I was shocked, so much so that when she started yelling at me, I didn't hear the words she was saying. She had been convinced I was cheating on her, and when I told her my reason for being so distant, for going off twice a week for a few hours, I was driving to see a therapist a good distance from my work and my home life. She was angry that I would try to lie about it and use such a lame excuse. She was offended that I thought she would believe me and thought I was just being a disrespectful asshole to her. She left me the same day. I was devastated. For the first time in the months since the incident, I didn't think of my terrifying encounter. I thought of my terrifying marital situation. I don't include any of it in the story, or very little, but I spent a few years trying to get her back. I watched as she built a new life with a new man. I can't express the level of depression to which I sank. I was put into a no-win situation. I had to tell her what happened, but when I did, it was the end of our marriage. For a long time, I wondered what I could have done differently and never came up with an answer. My wife's reaction made me realize that there are people who believe in the possibility of an undiscovered hominid sulking through our forests and those who don't. My wife was an avid non-believer, apparently. Before my encounter, I would have to say I was open to the possibility, but skeptical. If the tables were turned, I might very well have had the same reaction my wife had. Writing this down has been very therapeutic for me, and hoping listening to it will be beneficial to those of you who may be in the same situation. You are not alone, you are not crazy, and if you need to tell anyone about your sighting or encounter, consider lying. I sometimes wonder that had I just lied and told my wife I cheated, we would have stood a better chance of working through it, but I could never bring myself to lie. I also want to be clear, I don't think the Bigfoot was anything more than curious, but I was terrified. I don't think he meant me any harm. I didn't feel anger or aggression, but I was scared out of my mind. I have no desire to hunt them down or see them again. I do think they should be protected and left alone if possible. I have no active association with any group or organization that wants to save them, kill them, profit off them, debunk them, or discuss them ad nauseum. I had no interest in them before this encounter that messed up my life beyond watching the occasional television show that may be on. And since that encounter, I wish never would have happened or or that I would have handled it better. I've researched them only as a tool to cope with the aftermath of what has happened to me. In the long run, I've come to realize that given my wife's reaction, it turned out I was better off without her as I am now happily remarried and know what real love and loyalty is. 
but I'm not angry with her, and I don't blame her. In fact, now that my life is what it is, I can look at her in her idyllic life and be happy for her. I never thought I would get to this point, and as my current wife has pointed out, if I hadn't had this event shake up my life, the inevitable would have happened. Knowing and experiencing what I have since then, I can see that we would have ended up divorced just at a later date. I can be grateful that we were still in the early stages of our marriage, that we had no children, no home, or mutual major investments, and we had no substantial assets to split between us. But most importantly, had the events of my life not unfolded exactly the way they did, I would have never had met my current wife. This bit of logic did a great deal to heal me, and as time passes, I see just how fortuitous the event was. Even though I still have nightmares and phobias, I wouldn't change a thing because of how things turned out. Obviously, I told my current wife about my encounter, but I did very early on when we were dating, and she believed I saw something. It bothers me she doesn't believe me 100%, but that's okay, because she believes I'm not lying. Before my encounter, I would have thought the same. I would have assumed there's a very good chance I was high or mistaken or so scared my mind played tricks on me. But I know what I saw. It was clear and up close and in my face. The world is a bigger place than you can imagine. There is lots of room for giant hairy men to hide from us, but most of us live in densely populated areas. It makes sense since most of the population lives this way, the world can feel small, and we have never seen a Bigfoot. Even the so-called camping trips, hiking, and most other activities we indulge in out in nature are not really that far off the beaten path. I suspect Bigfoot, like most other creatures in tune with nature, try and stay away from humans and the paths we beat. Being a city dweller or even a rural resident means you are tethered to civilization. Being tethered to civilization can lead folks to the false conclusion that there is nowhere in the U.S. that a 10-foot tall creature could possibly hide. That tether gives us the illusion that we are seeing an entire area as we can pass through with ease on a modern road. Add technology into the mix and we think we know everything. You may think, man has been there, he's been everywhere. There are roads crisscrossing our nation. I've just driven across Northern California on a highway through the very forested regions you speak of. As a result, you feel comfortable passing judgment on the existence of a certain creature. But while a road or highway may tether our communities together, passing through those forests and parks, it is foolish to think you have seen the entire area. The largest highway is still less substantial than a strand of hair when compared to the vastness of the area around it. There are millions of acres of densely forested land in the northern portion of California alone. Above, there's Oregon and Washington State, and then Canada, and finally Alaska. There are many places man has yet to step foot in within yards of these roads. A mile or more in, and you are in dark, thick forests where civilization has yet to be witnessed. And there are miles more of forest to go after that point. I, too, felt that man has seen it all on this tiny planet until my encounter and subsequent research and thinking on the manor. That's not to say that the creature dwells deep in the woods aren't aware of us. They are, in my opinion, very aware of our presence. If a creature with any intelligence, one that is at home in those dark forests, wants to remain hidden, it can easily do so. If a modern man can don a ghillie suit and go completely undetected by another man just inches from him, why couldn't a creature that has a natural ghillie suit do likewise? In addition, this creature is intimately familiar with the forests in which it lives and has no desire to interact with modern man. Yes, it is possible that on occasion it wanders too close to man and gets spotted. Maybe it's driven out to seek food or maybe it's just curious. And it is also quite possible that they can get sick, disoriented, or just make mistakes. And maybe they have reasons all their own that we could never know. Maybe they want to scare us away from burial ground, food source, or possibly a sacred place. I was in my pickup driving north from the Bay Area of California. 
I was actually leaving from the East Bay area and planned to go up the 1101 to the 199 and into Eugene. I wanted to take the scenic route. I didn't realize it would add up so much driving time to my trip. It's quite a lengthy drive and I had considered flying, but considering the cost and time, I decided to drive. It would take longer but cost less and I looked forward to the driving and quiet time. It was a beautiful day when I started driving. I had a fresh, large coffee and some great music on the radio. It was like this for the first several hours, but I had procrastinated and left so late it was getting dark before I was out of California. I knew darkness would fall before I made it out to Oregon and planned to just keep driving until I got there. That's what caffeine and headlights are for, right? A few hours later and I was driving through intermittent rain and it was hard to see. I was fighting sleep and decided it would be safer to pull over and sleep for a while. I considered getting a room, but I hadn't seen any signs of civilization for some time and I'm cheap, so I decided to pull over somewhere and sleep in my truck. I pulled off the highway, which I don't think I was actually on at this point. I had taken a wrong fork or something earlier and wasn't where I thought I was. I drove a mile, keeping track of the distance so I could get back to the highway. I was on what was a smooth tarmac road tightly lined with trees and there was nowhere to pull off the road without hitting a tree or going into a ravine. Turning my truck around would have been impossible as well because the road was so narrow. After a mile, the tarmac ended abruptly and the road turned to dirt. The vegetation grew closer to the edge of the road and it was pitch black all around me. I felt like an idiot having driven so far in, but the further I drove in, the more invested I was in going forward just a little bit further. Also, the further I drove down this narrow road, the further I would have to drive backwards along the narrow, twisty, and treacherous night road to get out. Best go a little further until I can turn around. At this point in my life, I was far more worried about getting robbed or murdered than seeing a Bigfoot. That hadn't even crossed my mind, but as I write this and relive that drive, I wish I could yell at my past self and tell me to get the hell out of there. I was also worried about getting roused by cops and getting a ticket. I wanted to find a place I could sleep comfortably for maybe an hour. I finally saw a break in the vegetation in my headlights and slowed to a crawl or a slower crawl. It was a wide space between the trees that led back a few yards, about 30 yards as it turned out. It looked to be a place that may be used as a camping spot. I didn't see any evidence of this, but could not think of any other reason on a dirt road or path would lead to a small clearing with nothing there and no other way out. I was happy with the spot and turned my truck to face the road I came in on. When I woke up, all I had to do was drive forward and take a left and drive until I was back on the highway. I killed the engine, made sure the doors were locked, and tilted my seat back. I was out like a light and slept soundly for how long, I'm not sure. With the truck off, there was no light, and I mean no light. It was pitch black. I was far from any light sources and under towering trees surrounded by thick vegetation. It was a foggy night. It was a little cold, but there was so much moisture in the air, it felt sticky and stuffy in the cab of my truck. I opened the windows about an inch to let the air circulate, but the trees were dripping so much it was a constant drizzle of big fat drops of water that would pop on the roof and hood of the truck. They would sometimes hit the edge of the window and send smaller drops all over and the interior of my truck. I had to close the driver window because of this, and I'm glad I did. The only noise I heard was the intermittent plop of those big drops hitting my truck, and occasionally my ear would pick up the drops as they landed on the vegetation outside my little sleeping chamber. I woke up and I have no idea if I heard or sensed something. I thought nothing of it and it really could have been nothing as I've before and since awoken from a deep sleep for apparently no reason. Sometimes I would wonder why I woke up like that but usually I just went right back to sleep. This time I went right back to sleep without a second thought. A bit later, I woke up again abruptly, and this time it was because I thought I heard the handle on the passenger side of the truck getting pulled and let go. I thought it had to be my imagination and tried to shrug it off, but now I was wide awake and listening. It was then I realized I heard footsteps outside the truck in the dark. 
At first, I assumed what I was hearing were the patter of the drops, but my mind keyed in on the pattern of the sound, footsteps. At first, I thought it was human. Then I thought a deer or bear. I was about to start my truck and drive away when something snorted and bumped the bed of the truck. I relaxed because I assumed it was a deer and I could ignore it. I closed my eyes again and fell asleep. The third time I woke up, I would not be going back to sleep for a long time. I was jolted awake from a deep sleep by a loud crashing sound. The truck shook violently, and at first I thought it was an earthquake. I was confused and a little disoriented in the dark. I flipped on my lights and saw nothing but vegetation. Tree branches filled my view. I sat there, staring at a fallen tree, glad it didn't hit my truck. Then I heard a weird snort bark and felt the rear of my truck sink as something large stepped into it. I clicked the lights off and looked out of the cab rear window, but it was pitch black. Whatever had stepped into the cab jumped out shortly after and the truck bucked wildly. But even at this point, I was more startled than afraid. I was worried that a large predator could break the windows and get to me. I was now assuming the thing walking around outside was a large bear, and I wanted to get out of there. I started my truck and put it in reverse. I tried to back up, and the wheels spun in the dirt. I cut the wheels and tried to rock the truck back and forth to free it. Suddenly, the rear of my truck went up in the air. I looked over my shoulder, and the reverse lights illuminated something big and dark, but I could see no detail. Now, I wanted to know what was harassing me. I was still thinking it was a bear. In fact, I was sure it was a grizzly. I had no idea if they lived in the area, but I could think of nothing else it could be. My truck dropped to the ground with a bone-jolting impact. The engine had died, but I didn't try to restart it. I reached over and opened the glove compartment and retrieved a flashlight. I heard whatever it was was walking outside. A tree limb snapped outside the passenger window, and I heard the snort again right outside the passenger window. I clicked the flashlight on, and I swear my heart stopped. Then it started to beat like a machine gun in my chest. A large face was looking back at me from the passenger window. It didn't look fully human, but something felt very much human about it. I think it was the eyes and the way it looked at me. It squinted, looking at the light for a second. Then it was gone. I was in shock. I remember the light was off at this point, but I don't remember turning it off. I must have done it right after the face moved away. I was so scared that I was frozen in place in the dark. I literally couldn't move. Soon I realized that I had wet myself. I never thought that was actually possible, but I was sitting in quite the puddle of urine and have no memory of it leaving my body. I lay myself across the bench seat and covered my face like a child. I was hiding from it, the monster I had just seen. I started to cry, I will admit. I shook violently and cried. All was silent for a few minutes, but I was not going to move. I prayed to God that something would happen to take me away from here. I remember wishing my truck would fly away or the sun would magically come up hours earlier than it was normally supposed to. I began to relax. I felt my heart beginning to slow. I think the stress of the situation was actually making me feel tired. I yawned and I waited. I have no idea how long I waited, but at this point, my plan was to wait for daylight and get my truck unstuck and then get the hell out of there. I lay perfectly still, wishing I could hide deeper in my truck somehow. I was painfully aware of all the glass that surrounded me. I was starting to get more comfortable with the idea that I was safe and I just needed to wait here until morning. I was starting to doubt what I had seen. Soon I had convinced myself that what I had seen was probably a bear looking at me and I scared it off. I started to drift off into sleep. I heard a clinking in the woods. It sounded like two hard sticks or rocks being struck together three or four times. I didn't think much of it, but I was curious as to what had made the sound. It stopped, and a moment later, I heard the same clicking from another direction and further away. All was silent for a while. Intermittently, I would hear the clicking and the heavy creatures moving around outside my truck. I was sure it was bears, and as long as they weren't attacking my truck, I was okay. I reached up in the darkness and rolled the passenger window all the way up. I felt safer already. All was quiet for 
quite some time, I was actually feeling bored but dared not fall asleep. I'd finally gotten calm and comfortable enough that I relaxed. It had been quiet for so long that I felt safe and was content to just sit and wait. My mind wandered for the first time and I was starting to think about the meeting I had in the morning. At this point, I would get into Oregon so late that I would try and postpone the meeting and promise to tell my colleagues about my adventurous night in the woods. I would shower and sleep in a bed safe in a building with no animals around me. Suddenly, I heard the clicking sound start up close by and soon it sounded like maybe three to five sets of sticks began rhythmically struck together within ten or so feet of the truck. I jumped at this. My heart was in my mouth. I was terrified. That was too purposeful of a sound, too orchestrated and too consistent to be anything but human. The clicking abruptly stopped and then I heard huffs and chuffs and grunts. And I I knew at this point I was surrounded by the creatures called Bigfoot. I didn't want to believe it, but I had no other ideas as to what could be out here. And I had seen the face, and it was no bear. The clicking started again, but this time I heard a deep moaning along with it. It was so deep I could feel it humming through my bones. I felt utterly vulnerable at this point. I clutched the bench seat and prayed to God as I've never done before. I will spare you all the details of my scanty religious upbringing and the adulthood devoid from any form of faith and tell you that at that moment I didn't care if there was a God or not. If there wasn't, fine. If there was and I had a chance at rescue, then I was going to beg him for help with all of my heart and I did. The stick clicking continued on, ratcheting up my fear rapidly until I had enough. I think I was finally so desperate to get away from there, I decided to start my truck and try driving away again. The engine roared to life and the headlights lit the foliage up. I dropped the truck into reverse and looked behind me. The reverse lights were illuminating at least four legs, long hairy legs that ended at the hips and at least five feet off the ground. I floored my trucks and the legs didn't move. Move, and neither did my truck. I changed to drive and attempted to go forward and over the tree in front of my truck. My truck didn't get very far into the branches. I cut the wheel and backed up. I managed to get my truck to swing to the right and at almost a 90 degree angle, my headlights cleared the branches and I saw a figure before me. It was at least eight feet tall and its head was lost in the darkness, but it was clearly biped. I saw its long, thick arms hanging to its knees. It stepped casually aside and was gone. I tried to drive forward and the rear of my truck went off the ground again. The wheel spun in space. I started to blow the horn and that must have startled the creatures. My truck crashed to the ground and shot forward. But the engine stalled as I overcompensated for the sudden acceleration and slammed on the brakes. I tried to start it again, and the rear went up again. I shut off the truck and waited in the darkness. This time, the truck lowered to the ground more gently. I lay back down and closed my eyes and tried to calm down. It was obvious they weren't going to let me leave. At least now, I thought, I could get my truck moving away from here when the opportunity presented itself. I waited in the sudden silence for what seemed like 20 minutes, if I had to guess. The creatures had yet to attack me. This realization calmed me a bit, but I was far from okay. They could have easily ripped my truck apart. Putting their hands through my windows would have been effortless for them. So they didn't want to hurt me, at least not yet. I wasn't sure what might trigger them to suddenly decide it was time to pull me out and rip me to pieces or bite my head off. I thought at this point they might be playing with me or maybe warning me off the area. If that was the case, why did they trap me here? Maybe they wanted me good and scared? I have no idea. Finally, I noticed the sky glowing lighter. Dawn was here, and sooner than I had hoped for. I sat up and looked around. There was nothing. The felled tree to my left and the grass in the little area was all flattened out. I pulled the truck forward and fought hard not to floor it, but I did drive as fast as possible out of there and onto the tarmac road. I raced to what I thought was the highway and got on it. It would be an hour before I realized I had taken a wrong turn somewhere in the night and was, in fact, not on the highway. As terrifying as this encounter was, the aftermath of it that played out in my life for years to come easily equaled or even surpassed the misery of that night. It was just 
pain and misery spread out over such a period of time, it didn't feel as acute. I arrived in Oregon hours later after the meeting had started. I checked into my hotel and ignored the numerous messages. I left strict instructions that I was not to be bothered, then unplugged the phone. I lay in bed and cried as my head spun with complete confusion. I had no idea what to do at that point. I never drank very much, but I almost emptied the mini bar that afternoon. I was so desperate for sleep, and it was not forthcoming. Needless to say, I drove back to California on highways that avoided heavily wooded areas as much as possible. In fact, from that point on, I was afraid of the dark, which I never had been even as a child. I didn't like wooded areas, even a park with a clump of trees made me nervous. At that time, I lived in a very suburban neighborhood, but there was some undeveloped land behind my house. It was maybe a tenth of a mile until you hit the highway, and this land was bordered by Main Street and surrounded by a densely populated city. But I had to move from the area. That wooded area terrified me. If I had to go outside at night, I wouldn't. I started having panic attacks for no reason. My wife was increasingly more harsh and impatient for me to come clean, and that just made matters worse for me. I was still drinking too much. I started seeing a therapist a few months after the incident. It took me weeks to be able to utter the words, I saw Bigfoot. I was sure the woman thought I was nuts or lying. I immediately told her I had no desire to relive it. I just wanted it to go away. I was leaving and started to tell her I was ending my therapy with her when she said something that made me stick around. I don't believe in Bigfoot, not at all. We promised we would be honest with each other, and the truth is, I think all Bigfoot sightings are mistakes, lies, or hallucinations. I believe that you are not lying, but you are not a trained woodsman. By your own admission, you haven't even been a Boy Scout and have almost no experience being outdoors. So I believe you are sincerely struggling with what happened, and I can help you. I don't need to believe in Bigfoot. It doesn't matter if I do. My job isn't to prove you are wrong or lying, but to help you deal with whatever happened. I stopped and looked at her. I can accept that. As a result, she thoroughly questioned me. In her mind, there was a possibility I ingested a hallucinogen or had a physical or chemical problem that caused it. I agreed to all this testing because I wanted to know if I actually ate a mushroom somehow, somewhere, or had a brain tumor. There was nothing, and to her credit, all during this time, I was being subjected to her tests and numerous questions. She was reading up on Bigfoot. It was she that actually started telling me about the vastness of our wilderness and the possibility of an undiscovered hominid. At first, she was frustrated, being skeptical and annoyed by all the Bigfoot hunters and sightings. But then she hit the material that was more scientific. Looking at it that way, it made perfect sense to her that I might have encountered a North American hominid, a surviving species that was yet to be discovered. There are so many numerous examples of these creatures thought extinct that turn up still breathing, the celiocanth, the billy apes, etc. It has actually been very recent as far as history and time goes that we've discovered gorillas, zebras, pandas, and more. I was glad I stuck with her. Having hardcore non-believers take a hard look into what I claimed to have seen made me feel very much respected. I wasn't dismissed as a kook or a liar. It also made me feel great that she looked with an open mind and came to believe there is a possibility that there are massive hominids walking the earth. It actually makes sense as there have been so many strains of hominid, it stands to reason that more than one have survived. I don't know what to believe when I hear of others who have had an encounter even close to mine and actually want to go back out into the woods and see the creature again. Are they lying? Are they that different than me? Was their encounter different? All I know is there is no way in hell I would step foot in those woods again. I have no desire to see those creatures again. As I stated earlier, they didn't feel threatening or violent, but I was terrified and still am when I think of that night. Before that night, I thought Bigfoot a remote possibility. I also thought I had a good marriage. I had confidence in all areas of my life. I wouldn't think twice about walking in the woods at night, much less stopping in a locked truck. I never thought it possible to wet myself in fear and not realize I was doing it when it happened. That night changed me profoundly and in ways I never thought possible. 
think twice before you go looking for the giant, wild, hairy man, because you might just find him. I hope you enjoyed those stories, and if you did, be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. I post new videos every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and if you have your notifications on, you'll be the first to know when those go live. Again, thank you so much for watching the video, and until next time, bye!